and then my arm starts tingling and all of a sudden my um my bicep starts like getting a bit tight and tingly and pins and needles all the way up to my shoulder and at this point it's about an hour had passed and my whole hand had gone completely numb i had full dexterity i could do whatever i wanted but like you could prick it with a pin and it didn't feel a thing did not feel a thing um and i was still bleeding at this point as well it'd been an hour and obviously that could just be an anticoagulant but um yeah and then i had pins and needles in my arm for four hours maybe and then my hand didn't come back to normal properly properly for over a week yeah they're definitely venomous we haven't done enough study on it and i don't think people want to <laughs> but in as a monitor keeper if you ask any monitor keeper and especially if they've been bitten by a monitor they will tell you that they're venomous <laughs> Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Paul Burrows, who is the creator behind the Instagram channel or Instagram page and YouTube channel, Paul's Monitors. Now, for those of you who have been messaging me over the years to do a monitor-specific episode, finally, we are doing one today. You know, I've discussed monitors on the podcast in the past and several times, really, but, but quite often, it's in the light of maybe we shouldn't be keeping these group, this group of animals. And quite, I mean, anytime I talk about that, it's because we're discussing the larger species, the, the water monitors, the Nile monitors, the crocodile monitors, you know, the ones that are actually very large and dangerous and can pose an issue for just the regular average day keeper. But in this episode, it, it's a perfect foundation for anyone who is fascinated with monitors, could see themselves keeping them one day, but just doesn't know where to start. So in this episode, we really spoke focus on some of the dwarf species, the arboreal species like the tree monitors and then some of them meet more medium sized like peach throats and mangrove monitors and we use those species to facilitate a discussion just general keeping practices of monitors because really yes there's nuances with each species but if we, we want to have a sort of a general foundation for what does it take to keep a monitor successfully this episode will give you that we discuss lighting and heating enclosure sizes enrichment um, s- socializing the animals what it takes to do that how much time money commitment space does a keeper need in order to be successful with these these animals there's so much to talk about with ranids and that's why i've always been kind of intimidated by doing an episode about them because there's just so much to discuss but i think this is a perfect foundational episode for anybody who just wants to dip their toe into that world world. This should give you a great starting point to then go on and start doing research if if this is something that you do want to pursue. If you're looking for more information on this episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you'll find the show notes and everything. Any links or anything that we've mentioned in the episode will be there. If you'd like to support us over on Patreon, you can do that at patreon.com slash animalsathome. I noticed earlier today we are at 99 patrons. It usually goes up and down. You know, sometimes a month I'll get a couple and then I'll lose a couple because people, you know, come and go, which is totally fine. This, that, that's the point of the platform to come and go. We're at 99. So we're so close to hitting 100, which I think would be really, really cool. So for anybody who's already supporting me there, thank you so much. But if you do want to do that, you can find the link in the show notes or the YouTube description. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this podcast. They have a wide variety of high premium level enclosures. As you can see, the ones behind me, you can find videos of me setting them up on my YouTube channel as well. If you are looking for new enclosures, make sure you head to a link in the show notes or the YouTube description that is an affiliate link. So if you do make a purchase, a commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you. And if you'd like to pick yourself up an Animals at Home t-shirt or sweater, you can do that over at animalsathome.ca slash shop. $5 $5 does get donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy. If you're interested in that charity or learning more about that charity, just listen to the episode a couple previously. I think one episode 158 with Jana Bell. Fascinating. But anyway, let's jump into this episode with Paul. Enjoy. This is Dr. Chris Jenkins, CEO of the Orient Society and host of the Snake Talk podcast. We are pleased to announce the launch of our new Hudson Berkshire Turtle Conservation Program. Turtles are one of the most endangered groups of animals on the planet, and the Orient Society aims to reverse this trend by working to conserve Blandings, Bog, Spotted, and Wood Turtles in one of the most critical regions in North America. The Hudson Berkshire region of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts is the only place in the world where all four of these turtles occur and their populations and habitats are declining. 
a generous donor is helping us launch the Hudson Berkshire Turtle Conservation Program by matching the funds we raise during our Long Live the Turtles campaign. If you care about turtles or restoring wildlife habitat, please consider supporting our efforts by donating today and having your conservation investment doubled. The campaign runs until World Turtle Day on May 23rd. Learn more about our program and how you can get involved at www.orian.org. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. This is such an honor to be here. It's watching you on my TV as like a wee, wee keeper. Now look at me. <laughs> Now you're on the show. It's awesome. We've, we've been <laughs> wanting to do this for a while now, so I'm really excited to have you on. And and to be honest, I've had so many people reach out and say, I wanted, to, I want you to do a monitor episode, an episode focused on Vranids. And I never know exactly how to tackle that topic because it's kind of a general topic. And it's also one of those, you know, we, we talk about the ethics of keeping, and I think there's some ethical issues with keeping some monitor species, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. So I, I never really knew how to cover that topic. And I think you're the perfect person because you have, a, you know, a experience with a decently wide amount of species but also species that are more reasonable to keep i think and then also some that maybe are a bit on the larger side so we will get into that but i'm very curious how you got to where you are now you know i'm sure you were a reptile person or reptile enthusiast as a, as a, as a young kid but what got you into monitors specifically uh <laughs> so i don't know if it's true but apparently fun fact that the jurassic park velociraptors in lost world the eyes are croc monitor eyes they use the verana salvadori the croc monitor's eyes for the jurassic park raptors and obviously being a 90s kid jurassic park was like massive in my life mm -hmm. um and it was the eyes of the velociraptors i remember vividly like the and now obviously keeping monitors i see the dilution of the pupils in the eyes so maybe subconsciously that was a i didn't know that until later in life but subconsciously i was like wow these are so cool but for the most part, I was just into reptiles full stop. And I only really got into monitors in a sense of knowing my passion with monitors. When I was like seven, eight, I saw a green tree monitor in like a magazine. And I was like, what is this animal? And then I wasn't allowed to keep reptiles really as a kid. And then I moved out at 17 and just went crazy and did like we all do. And buy, I'll have one of this and one of that and one of this mm. and one of that. And then as I matured as a person and a keeper... I started to like narrow in what I wanted to do. And to be completely honest, the monitor keeping community, they're all terrible because they're all like, no, you can't get monitors. They're too hard work. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe I'll get your platus or maybe I'll get, I don't know, a beardy or this, that and the other. And then obviously I was like, this is not what I want. So this is now another animal I need to rehome. And then I eventually put on my big boy pants, didn't listen to anybody else and decided to keep varanids. And I've been keeping solely varanids for about three years now. Wow. And so what did you start with initially? In the sense of monitors or just pets full stop? Uh, monitors, monitors. So I had a Savannah monitor back when, and then my first monitor in phase two of my life. Um, so basically, long, just long story short, from 17, 18 until 24, I kept pretty much everything. But the only monitor I had was a Savannah or a Bosque monitor. Um, and then... In 2019, when I got back into it, um, my first one was an Aki monitor. Okay. And then t tell me a little bit about the the progression from there. So you started with your Aki in this phase two, and, now, and then maybe you could work us from that to where you are now, because you have quite a large room full of a bunch of different species, and uh, that, that was only four years ago, so you've kind of hit, you know, hit went to the pedal to the floor with the monitor keeping. So did it, was it something that you always planned? Like I'm going to have a larger collection of monitors or did it just slowly ramp from there? If I'm again, I'll be completely honest. Anyone that knows me knows that I don't shy away from hard truths. The reality is I wish I didn't get as many as I did as fast as I did. And I'm happy to hold my hands up and go, I have too many. Um, I'm about at capacity now. If I get much more, I wouldn't be able to care for them properly. I could probably do with maybe selling one or two, but I can just about juggle it. But I went from, <laughs> I don't recommend anyone do this, but I went from an Aki to a mangrove monitor, um, which is like night and day. And my mangrove monitor is straight from hell. So she's <laughs> psychopathic, evil, food driven, just wants to like, just 
so high energy, so alert, so inquisitive and intelligent, but with a little zest of like bitchiness, if I can say that. But yeah. she, um, yeah, yeah. she, she's yeah. So I went from her, that to Mangrove. Then I got some team on monitors. Then, which I no longer keep. But then I, I got some team on monitors. Then, if I'm remembering correctly, I got my first green tree monitor. Um, and then I shortly after got another green tree monitor and then i got some more ackies started to breed ackies then i got um a pilbarensis so a pilbara rock monitor and then i got a glowered eye so a kimberly rock monitor um and then got some tristus so black-headed guanas or black-headed monitors and then this was all in like a one-bed flat <laughs> then oh my god <laughs> and then yeah, you haven't got to tell me. So we had floor to ceiling, every single room in the house, the kitchen, the bedroom, um, yeah, the living room, every single room, floor to ceilings, lizards. So I said to my girlfriend, I was like, do you want to move in with me before I started collecting all these monitors? And she was like, no, the flat's too small. I'm going to stay and I'll just stay over it like every now and then. I was like, all right, cool. So I filled the flat up with, <laughs> with monitors and then she moved in with me during lockdown. So there was not enough space um, for me, my girlfriend. I also have a son who stays with me on the weekend. So there was not enough space. We had to move. And then every house we I only rent, but every house we went to that we looked at, if there wasn't like a 16 foot long wall with no like space, I was, as soon as I walked in, I was like, nope, this isn't the place. And the estate agents are like, but why? I was like, I won't be able to fit eight foot vivs there. And they're like, okay, <laughs> straight to the <laughs> next place. Um, and then, yeah, then I moved out and then I went crazy and got, um, five more mangrove monitors and so i have six. Oh wow uh, i didn't realize you had that monitor. many yeah i've got the largest collection of mangrove monitors in the uk which wow. again i don't recommend <laughs> but <laughs> yeah i've got six mangrove monitors a peach throat monitor uh three tree monitors green tree monitors prusinus four gill and i pygmy mulgars a pair of kimberly rocks uh, i'm just trying to go around my room a bearded dragon a bredel's python a corn snake a tarantula a scorpion uh, Savannah monitor, free Aki monitors. I'm going to miss someone because I always do this. Um, yeah, so it, it just went, it went really quickly. And now I'm sort of in the point of my life where I'm like, do you know what? I have, because mangrove monitors now are my thing. I just love mangroves. They're my main project. But like anyone who listens to this will understand, it's really easy to care for one species, regardless of the numbers, obviously time and space allowing but when you have multiple species trying to be like okay this monitor is starting vitilogenesis my ackies today for example were attacking each other because the male wanted to breed and the females not in vitilogenesis so i had to split them and if i'm not there to notice it then i've got another monitor i don't know going through some sort of season where it's like not eating so i've got to pay attention to make sure its weight's not dropping and there's just so much going on so i'm like 24 7 so that's why i kind of wish in hindsight that I just streamlined and just did like one or two species, but it's a little bit too late for that now. Yeah. Yeah. You're in it. Yeah. And they I love them all. I can't, can't rehome them. Like a lot of philosophy, like I know you guys have spoken with several guests. People look, if, if you brought a dog, you wouldn't sell your dog as part of your family. That's it. It's your pet forever. Mm -hmm. I buy a reptile. I don't like it. I'll sell it. Like we've all done it. So I'm not shaming anyone. I've, I've done it and I still will do it. I'm probably going to look to rehome my snakes. But I want to get to the point where my reptile collection is invaluable. They're pets, you know, like as much as I want to breed them in bits and bobs, they're pets. And I don't want to be like, oh, if you offered me a thousand pounds, I would take it. I just want to be like, no, it's not for sale. Oh, what yes. about 10 pounds? It's not for sale. That's what I want to try to get to. So if I if in my head the species has a monetary value, then I'm like, you know what? It's not for me. And that's why I've sort of dwindled off Timorensis, Timor monitors, Pilbarensis um and then there was tristus as well so i i got out of those three species just because i was like ah, in my head if someone offered me money for them i'd sell them so i didn't want to keep them anymore if that mm -hmm. makes sense yeah it really does make sense i mean if 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 no one's had a dog if you if the listener that hasn't had a dog as the, as a great example then it might not click as well but if you have had a dog that's such a good example because if you have a family pet you have a connection with it just selling it is never an option. It's not. It's not ever talked about. It's not on the table at all. It doesn't. If someone came to you and said, "Can I give you ten thousand dollars?" You'd be like, "No, <laughs> that, does, that doesn't make sense." Like it, it'd be like selling your kid. Like you would never do that. It's. It's not a question. So I think that's actually a really good 
probably a good analogy and a good mental exercise to go to go through to see whether or not you're truly passionate about the species that you you have. So what what are they in right now? Because as far as the room, because when I watch on YouTube on Instagram, it looks like they're in maybe like a shed or something. Is it inside your house or where are the yeah, enclosures? It's a, so it's an it's. I'm assuming they're the same in Canada and America, but it's basically a conservatory, so like a sunroom. Okay. Um, so it's a. I haven't measured it, but it's roughly about 25-ish foot long um, by 14 foot wide, roughly, at the okay. back of my bungalow. Um, attached to so the house? the whole length of the... Yeah, attached. So as soon as you go through the front door, you immediately turn right. The tortoise and the guinea pigs are there. And then as you come round the corner, you look straight down and the whole... That's it, whole attached. So yeah, I... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, attached to the house, a big, massive reptile room at the back of the house yeah so when you saw that you must have been like this is the place <laughs> it's so i won't go into this because it's a long story but we we as soon as i saw it oh you're right i was like this is the place we applied for it we were shortlisted of ourselves and one other couple and we lost out to the other couple and i was gutted i was gen because we'd viewed so many houses i was gutted and then we got a phone call from the estate agent saying, oh, the other couple's pulled out. The estate agents want to offer, the landlords, sorry, want to offer it to you first before it goes back on the market up for rent. And my girlfriend was like, oh, no, it wasn't meant to be because like we, I was like, no, I'm going to stop you there. We're yeah. not having a democracy. <laughs> like We're moving to this house. And she was like, oh, OK. And it was winter. It was like October when we moved or November when we moved. And now it's starting to turn to spring. The garden's got such beautiful wildflowers, which is so nice, which obviously we didn't know. And now she's like, oh, I kind of uh, kind of agree. We This is a nice place. I was like, I told you. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm glad that worked out and having that many, even just listening to you list off the monitor species and the, the, the number that you have, it sounds like a tremendous amount of work. And, and what would you say? Cause I'm, I'm sure there are people who are old time monitor keepers who have been keeping monitors for 40 years and they will probably hear a story of somebody like you who, who's gone from zero to a hundred and go, Oh, this is a, a terrible idea. This is somebody that's, you know, just jumping in or naively jumping into this. What, what, what do you say to people that I'm sure you've gotten that feedback before from people? Yeah. So I, I won't name names cause I'm not interested in drama. There was a guy, um, that kept mangroves and is quite successful with mangroves. And when I first started keeping mangroves, I reached out to him and I was like, Hey man, I love your stuff. Really support you. Like you're an idol, this, that, and the other. I've just got my mangrove. Like, is there any chance you could help me sex it? And he was giving me time of day, a bit short, but giving me time of day. And then he started to like out of nowhere, like wail on me. Like you don't know this and you don't know that. And you don't deserve this. Fast forward three years. I'm the only person in the UK ever to be getting regular cycled planned eggs from a mangrove monitor, full stop. Look at me now. And then I'm the only person in the UK to be able to like pinpoint the start and end to the point where I like literally get the day where my female mangrove's going to lay eggs, the start of vitilogenesis to laying eggs. And to my knowledge, there's no one doing that outside of, well, in the Western world, outside of Indonesia, there's no one doing that to the point where they go, yep, that is exactly what's happening. She will lay on this date. And I've done that now two times in a row. So it's, it's not luck. And she's had six clutches with me. And I've been off a day. The first clutch, I was a bit like, oh, second clutch, I was off one day. Third clutch, I was off one day. Um, fourth clutch and fifth. Yeah, fourth clutch off two days. And then fifth and sixth clutch to the day. It's just because I'm so intentive. I'm not, it's not necessarily that I'm a good keeper and I haven't got a God complex. But the trick is with monitors and all reptiles. If you're incredibly attentive to that one animal and you know exactly her demeanor, her body composition, exactly how she is, you will be able to tell when the slightest thing is off. So to the old timers, what I would say is, you're right, <laughs> I struggle because I can't tell every single animal as well as I can tell my true animals that I'm really putting my time into. So yes, you are right. But and then I would also say, you guys don't approach it the right way. You guys make didn't make me feel wanted. And I almost got a chip on my shoulder because no one told me that I could keep monitors and do it successfully. They were like, nope, you're not ready, blah, 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 blah. So you almost feel like you had a point to prove. And that's the only reason I started social is just to try and help people that were like me for years ago, because no one is in the sense of the monitor world. Like there are people that will help you, of course, but a lot of the old boys that have all the knowledge, they hold it in and they keep it to themselves. And then when you get... Because I'm 28, so when you get a 28 year old kid come in, 
and so I'd have been 25 when I started keeping them, 24. They were just like, nope, like you say, they generally are. And I've had several people. But now everyone wants to be my best mate, <laughs> which is funny. Yeah. But I remember back when, when none of them cared. And now right. that I'm doing good things, um, people are like, oh, how are you doing this? And I'm like, literally three years ago, mate, you were telling me to F off and just be like, <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. And I was just like... Okay, I, I won't forget. And again, I, I'm not interested in the dramas of the reptile hobby. I find it negatively affects my keeping if I let it seep in. So I forgive and not um, yeah, forgive and not forget. But yeah, I, I don't disagree with them. They're not wrong, but it can be done if you're the right person and dedicated. But it's a lot of work. Like, make no mistake, it's a it's a full full time job. Like, it's hard, man. It's hard. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I mean, if especially as someone who keeps snakes where the maintenance is relatively low and I'm just checking in on them. Like, you know, I'm, I, I check in on, on them every day, but it could be like minutes, you know, that's a minute of a couple of minutes a day and that's it. And a lot of times there's not that much to do. I'll miss them every day, but it's, I'm not feeding on a regular basis or having a, you know, I, I just know how much work monitor is. So in some ways I can see people being, I can see the inner monitor keeping society being more protective over it because they want they, they want to be careful who they bring in and of course there are people who come into that that hobby and have no idea what they're doing and then make mistakes or, or get injured or those sort of things but at the same time like you do want to foster new people and hopefully give them some great information to, to set them upright because if you don't give them the information then they're just going to try on their own and probably end up something you know something bad could happen so it's probably better to just be more fluid with the information and and so hopefully we can kind of do something like that today too with this episode just give people because i know there are so many people who are just completely fascinated by this group of animals they want to get in they don't know how to start or where to start it's very intimidating so i, I think the first like real question i have for you is the type of what type of person should keep varanids? You know, as in other words, what should they expect from their animal? How much time, money, space should they have? You know, I, I guess also like what are some what are some red flags? What are some things that people, if you're this type of person, you shouldn't have a monitor? I don't, I don't know if that, that might be too general of a question, but you have the experience, so maybe we'll just hear your thoughts. Yeah, so I would say a red flag straight away is if you're. Um, anxiety prone um and i say this as someone who does suffer with mental health so i understand it if you stress a lot monitors are not the one for example i did a reel on instagram recently of one of my gill and i which is a pygmy mulga monitor i hadn't seen it in two weeks and i was like just so stressed out that like, we all do it and so I, this enclosure is like real oak all foam to the back and these guys natural ecologies they wedge into like the smallest cracks and i knew it was in the background and in my head i was like it's obviously got in but it can't get back out because i foamed it i was like oh my god it's gonna die and it's stuck so i ripped the whole background apart and there it was happy as larry just like what are you doing <laughs> and i was just like oh god but i hadn't seen it in like two weeks so i was yeah. like Oh, and because it's an enclosure with three other gill and I, the food disappears. But I'm like, is that one been out? Is it? Because I don't know who's eating. So I'm like, oh, so if you're naturally prone to stress, <laughs> monitors, um, yeah, monitors probably aren't for you because sometimes they disappear. They're still in there, but sometimes they disappear. Yeah. Um, so I would say that's probably a red flag. But <sighs> you need to be financially stable because they're... Anything in moderation is okay. If you've just got an Aki, it's not much different to a bearded dragon. You're going to be paying a lot more in a food bill, but your heating, your lighting is more or less the same. And the enclosure size is going to be slightly bigger, but not by much. But they are, they do need a lot of money. They need high wattage UVBs, which obviously up front are more expensive than just, for example, your um, 6%. So you're going to want your 12 to 14%, depending on how big the viv is. You're going to want one to two basking spots because these guys are like it hot. My Savannah monitor, I worked it out the other day, is drawing one, two, three, four hundred and fifty watts just for one enclosure. And in comparison, that's about three beta dragon vivs, like on average, based on the lamp and just UVB. So my right. one Bosk monitor is the same as keeping three bearded dragon vivs. And it's and that it eats more than three bearded dragons put together. So it's like huh, for like a twenty five dollar lizard, it's costing me literally like we're including the electric probably like a hundred pound a week just to bloody wow. <laughs> keep a savannah monitor and i don't even do it as well as some people do like i don't again I'll, i'm brutally honest i don't keep my savannah monitor the best 
like it's not in a ginormous 10 by 5 by 5 like i'm building it a 7 by 4 by 3 in the next six to eight months it's only about a foot and a half long at the moment so it's still a small one but when it gets bigger that's only going to double the cost so you see a lot of people start with savannas and they're just such a terrible beginner monitor because they need a minimum of an eight by four by four but if you're talking minimums you shouldn't another red flag so if you're the sort of person that's like what's the minimum size enclosure i can put this animal in you shouldn't keep like any animal for that philosophy but especially varanids you shouldn't go old oh, minimum online is a four by two by two for an Aki. I can get an Aki. That's no, <laughs> no. So the minimum online, you want to add like a third on again. And then that's your minimum. Right. Um, and even then the minimum is the biggest you can provide. That should be a minimum when you're talking in Varanids. But yeah, if you're, as long as you've got money, you don't have to be an experienced keeper to keep, for example, something like an Aki. They take a little bit more reading than, say, a bearded dragon. They're a bit more twitchy, a bit more quirky, and the difference is you're going to bleed a lot if it bites you, yeah. um, and it does hurt. So as long as you're okay with that, like, I wouldn't recommend... It's, it's a hard one because I counteract myself. If you want an Aki and you're 12 years old and the pet shop says get a bearded dragon i don't believe that's right because like i said earlier when you get to 14 you're bored of your bearded dragon and you want an aki anyway either just wait the two years or show to your parents that you're responsible enough bits and bobs to be able to get this aki that you want but you need to understand the cost because it's going to cost you a lot it's going to take up a lot of space if it's in your bedroom your bedroom's going to become sweltering because the viv is so hot it radiates heat you know and you can't keep an aki if, for example, you've got some, let's just say, dart frogs, and you're like, oh, I'm going to put an Aki in my bedroom. All of a sudden, your ambience start creeping up. Your dart frogs are like, Oof, it's getting a bit hot in here. Yeah, so you yeah. need to like take into consideration like stuff like that as well. So that's why I just keep monitors. I have a beardy. It can deal with the heat. Um, my corn snake, bless him, he's in like one corner to the side, and he's got the lowest wattage halogen because my room currently, and we're only in, we're in May now, but he's... Um, my room is 27 degrees at the moment. Ambient. Oh, wow. Yeah, so God help me in the summer. She's going to be around 30, 35, but I'm going to get an air conditioned unit. And again, another cost, just expense, expense, more electric, more money. So, yeah, yeah. yeah money is what you need. <laughs> and when time, you were saying lots and that, lots of time. When you were saying that, you're, that, that the Savannah already is costing like 100 pounds a week, is that just, that's food, that's energy? I guess that's mostly what that would be. Yeah, so it's food, energy, and then that's pretty much all it is, P- purely because energy is so expensive. If energy wasn't so expensive, food, just food, if I was to buy it from a pet shop, if it was my, because I, I get bugs cheaper because I know people, <laughs> but if if I was just buying from a pet shop, I reckon, so I famine all of mine, they go for a winter period of three months um, where they get hardly no food at all, so we're feeding the savannah around nine months of the year and through spring i ramp up summer they get loads of food autumn we ramp down winter they don't really get anything so you're only really feeding it properly for six months but in those six months you're talking you've got to be talking six to ten live food boxes like a week of bugs wow like a, a week to feed a savannah monitor properly um if you're feeding, I know in America, locusts are hard to come by. In the UK, we we do locusts and grasshoppers regularly. But a tub of locusts, is, a box of locusts is about 8 to 10. An adult savannah monitor would go through 50 locusts and not show. Especially in the summer when you've got heat at like 60 degrees on your basking spot. That metabolism, it's just, it's flying. So that those locusts, and you're not supposed to feed them high protein like rodents and chicks and stuff. So the way they're eating bugs they're const- if they're in a big enough enclosure where they can actually exhibit natural behaviors and dig and run and stuff the metabolisms you know so they go through so much food and that's why you have to give them the winter period one so they can burn off all the fat they've just gained in the summer and two it's good if they do it in the wild it's a natural ecology and three it's good for the bank balance <laughs> so right yeah 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 yeah, that that's so. I guess, like you said, time, money, space; those are the three keys, and and commitment too. It, it, it's it's a lot more commitment than something like a corn snake, for example. So you do have to have those boxes checked. And then, as far as the species, I mean, I, I want to tr- try our best to keep things as m- more general because people will 
somebody might be listening to this who wants to get into monitors but doesn't know where to go as far as what species. So I, in my head, I kind of picture monitors as being on like a quadrant where you have uh, more terrestrial species and arboreal species, and then you have a dwarf species and then large species. So, And it seems like they all kind of fit in that box somewhere. So is is there maybe you could roughly kind of talk about some of the differences you have arboreal species and the terrestrial species and then some of the, the dwarf species as well i think any large species should be left to i mean i don't know how large the mangrove get but as far as like you know larger species asian wander monitors and whatnot those th- those are getting i think off the table for any, pretty much any regular pet keeper yeah for sure like i can't house a, anything over four foot in my personal opinion is too big mm-hmm. um mangroves are up to four foot some localities can get five foot, um, but mine are the smallest localities, so you'd expect between two and a half and three and a half foot. And that's nose length. to vent? That's total length, so including tail. Oh, including so tail, everything. okay. Yeah, yeah, so it's relative, like, on Instagram, my mangrove looks big. When people see her in person, like, oh, she's tiny. I'm like, mm. I know, yeah. <laughs> but she seems quite big. But she's she's 28 inches total length, so she's probably... 12 inches so she's about a foot long snout event there thereabouts the rest is tail so she's not very big um females being smaller than males males get bigger so males would be 18 to 20 inches snout event roughly um the rest being tail but yeah so when you get into monitors the first thing you're probably going to do is go to the audatria complex which is the dwarf monitors um majority of which come from australia so they're your ackies your tristus so your um black-headed monitors your kimberly rock monitors your pilbara rock monitors your king's rock monitors um veranus kingorum uh your gill and i so your uh pygmy mulga monitors those six are the common dwarf monitors um Aki's being and kingorum probably being the only two terrestrial of that group the rest are semi-arboreal gill and i are arboreal i'm pretty sure they have full prehensile tails it's definitely if not semi um but a gill and i is <laughs> same size as my phone so that's fully grown total length gill and i that's it wow so tiny tiny that's it so you can get you know people i people keep pairs or trios in the largest exoterra um i would like to at least see two foot deep but a three by two by three for a pair is okay it's okay you could you could do that i would like to see them in a bit bigger but it's definitely feasible to house two monitors a pair of gill and i in a three by two by three enclosure. When you say that, people can't fathom it because, like you say, they think Asian water monitors, they think black throat monitors, they think croc monitors. But a gill and I is generally head and body like four or five inches, like they're tiny. So, but they're all monitor. Like when it comes to feeding time, they're like little meerkats and their heads stick out of cork tubes and, and you put the cockroach in and they just all four of them fly out and now you're like jesus christ and you have to like have like six hands to feed them but they're all monitor but for some reason they're not known and people don't keep them and everyone goes to an aki which are great monitors but then they need a lot more space and if we're all lacking in space because we all keep animals we've all got like wives kids dogs you know we've all got something somewhere like rubbish that we've been keeping for five years so if you can get a tiny little monitor in a tiny little enclosure and set up like a little slice of australia then I'm all for it. I've got them and I'm in, I've only had them since January, but I'm in love with them. Like they're, they're great. Um, but they're so the dwarf monitors, they range between being a boreal, semi boreal Kimberly rock monitors. They're going to get 30 inches long, total length. They're a big lizard. They're going to want at least a three foot tall enclosure. Ideally same with Aki's. Um, they get two foot long total length, which is a big lizard. It generally is. They're small, but they are a two foot long lizard is a big lizard. Um, then obviously you've got the, the true arboreal stuff like your tree monitors and bits and bobs like that. And in the monitor world, they're the level up from your dwarf monitors. So you start, if you're going on the pyramid scheme, you start with your dwarf monitors and you work yourself up to these tree monitors, which are a bit more fragile. They're a bit more precise care. If you're a bit far out, two days low humidity, all of a sudden the toe's missing. So you, there's no room for error with a tree monitor so you sort of have to learn your stripes earn your stripes with other species to learn how to dial in humidity and temperature and stuff like that captive bred they're quite hardy like as far as lizards go if you i'm i i don't like to say i'm like an advanced keeper i'm always learning and growing um but like for the most part like touch wood i've been keeping tree monitors now for four years never had experience with tree monitors prior 
and I've had no issues. Obviously, I've kept reptiles before and I've kept monitors before, but tree monitors were my third monitor ever. So I had an Aki mangrove. I should not have gone from a mangrove to a to an Aki, um, from an Aki, but then I got into tree monitors, and the tree monitors are easier, arguably to care for than the Aki's because the Aki's you feel like you want to interact with. So you're messing around with their environment a lot more. So obviously the environment's open to a lot more changes because you're opening the Viv and you're playing around and you're changing. Whereas the tree monitor, you just sort of set it up and leave it be. Mm. So there, they, and then obviously you do have this, the middle range stuff, which is like your Savannah monitor, which is terrestrial. And then believe it or not, for some reason in America, mangrove monitors are throwaway basic, same as um, Savannah monitors, 50 bucks and you've got one and <laughs> they're like the most just the flighty intelligent crazy monitors and if you've never kept a monitor before again i'm all for getting the animal you want but you have no place buying a mangrove monitor or a savannah monitor on a whim like it just it just isn't if you're going to buy an aki on a whim i'll forgive you because they're very hardy <laughs> if yeah. you're going to buy animals like that then it's like Oh, you really should be doing your research because like a mangrove is a is a four by four. They climb, they swim, they dig, like they do same as the peach throats and those sort of they're they're everywhere. Like you give them a enclosure. I did all natural ferns and like plants and bits and bobs, like beautiful for about three days. And then it <laughs> I came home from work and the fern was on the basking spot. I'm like, how? And she's dug this tunnel under and obviously she's just been digging and she threw the fern onto the basking spot as she's digging. I'm like, Jesus Christ. And then water changes daily. So much maintenance, especially when you've got semi-aquatic animals, you know, big water bowls. You've got to lug it in and out. They break filters, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of filters. So they level up in the sense of you need to be a bit more experienced, but then they also level up in the sense of they cost more when you start to get into tree monitors, mangrove monitors, savannah monitors. Pretty much a good practice is the bigger the monitor, double the cost, pretty much. is the, right. the monitor might be 50 bucks, but it will cost you double what an Aki would cost you. So, yeah, if that answers the question. I sort of went on a tangent, so sorry. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I think that gives people a lot of info. As far as the enclosure size for the tree monitors, like maybe you can lay out the enclosure size that you recommend for the tree monitors as well as the you know the next up, mangroves and peach, uh, peach throat. Yeah, so... <sighs> I will, I will give a, I just want to give a caveat, but I will give a size. So a lot of people say the minimum for a tree monitor is a four by two by four um, for one. So you're talking green trees, the Prusinus or Rosingeri, Rosingeri, however you want to pronounce it. The yellow tree monitors being the two smaller of the complex. And then a, <clears throat> a four by two by five tool for Macrae, the blue trees, and then Bakari, the black trees. Some people do four by two by four for me it's too small mm. and again a minimum is the smallest i'm sorry a minimum is the biggest that you can physically house like six tall four wide two deep is a good size i'm planning on building an eight long two and a half deep seven tall for a pair of prasinus i currently have a prasinus in a uh because again i started online four by two by four the minimum okay i'll go a foot taller cool so i've got a four by two by five it's too it's too small it just is too small and i'm happy to hold my hands up and go now that i've kept it and this is why again i've started to say to people look learn from my mistakes it's too small if it was six foot tall five foot wide i personally would be like okay that's not too bad but because i'm me and i have this weird thing that i hate animals in boxes so i have to go as big as i can Mm -hmm. so i'm going eight foot by two and a half foot by seven foot which will house a pair with a divider for when the female's laying so they both get a four by two and a half by seven when they're split apart but yeah so minimum for a tree monitor i'm just going to say six foot tall four foot wide two foot deep if you can't have that you can't have a tree monitor as well in my personal opinion and then mangrove monitors <laughs> the sky's the limit like if you give them a 10 by 10 by 10 they're gonna use it which makes me very sad because i can't give mine 10 by 10 by 10s yeah but I'm building a 12 foot long by four foot by four foot for a pair is my plan. Yeah. Okay. So that, yeah, that's a, that's a big, that's a pretty big enclosure. And it, would the peach throat be around the same? Peach throat's a bit more semi arboreal. So peach throat will be, my peach throat's getting a seven long, four deep, uh, six tall is what okay. my peach throat's going to get. Yeah. So that gives people a pretty good idea of how much space you'd actually require for even, even a, 
what would be uh, considered a medium sized species monitor, right? When you're talking about monitors, you can get huge, but uh, you know, a, a mangrove and a peach are still uh, relatively in the center of, of how big they can get. And even, even the arboreal ones, like as far as the tree monitors, when you're saying uh, you looked at the enclosure five by two by four and you're like, that looks too small. What, what, what made you say that is just watching them in the enclosure, watching how quickly they move from place to place or. Yeah. So it's hard cause I've got, so I've got two adult males. Um, one is the most lazy animal on the entire planet. Doesn't do anything. You could put it in a two by two by two and it'd probably be look happy. Um, I wouldn't recommend that, but generally it doesn't do a lot. It comes up, it basks, it goes back, it hides. That's all it does. And I've spent like weeks off. Um, and it doesn't do a lot. And it's currently at my friend's house on a breeding loan. Um, and he messages me and he's like, is it all right? It doesn't do a lot. I was like, I know. So it's not just me it, and he's bread tree monitor, So he's more capable than I am. Um, but then my sarong, uh, he's in the five by four by two and he'll scale from the bottom to the top like that, like literally like that. And sometimes when he freaks out, cause he's very shy still, um, Sometimes when he freaks out, you they obviously just go up, they panic and they just go up. And then all of a sudden they're, they're scrambling at the lights. And I'm like, I wish you had like a 10 foot tall enclosure so you could scramble to eight foot and then chill out. But scrambling yeah. to five foot is it's just not enough for them. Um, and then again, he total length, he is about three foot long. And I'd like to be, I'd like him to be in an enclosure where he's at least got every area where he doesn't have to touch a wall, mm-hmm. you know. Um, that's a good rule of thumb that again, I've learned sadly the space i've got is only two and a half foot deep i can't give them bigger depth but that's why i'm going to the ceiling um i'm going seven foot tall because that's as tall as i can go just to try and make up for the space and they tree monitors like it if they're above you so again even if you're in a five foot viv try and raise it up off the floor i'm only a five foot eight man so six foot viv they can get above me so if i raise that five foot viv a foot and a half off the floor he would probably feel a lot more comfortable but because Obviously, the top of his vivs like here on me. I can be eye level, and obviously, eye contact for a flighty animal is a bit like, "Oh my god, I'm gonna die!" Yeah. So then they freak out. That's the only reason. But they they scale vertical branches. So I have vertical branches that are five foot long, floor to ceiling, and they will literally climb the whole branch. And then you can almost see them look up because I'm pretty sure he's a wild caught as well. Mm-hmm. You can almost see him look up, and he's like, "Well." that's my like there's my sky's the limit you know and it breaks my heart it generally breaks my heart like i'm not gonna lie i again i don't like animals in captivity in the sense of like we can find them i just don't like it in my brain it, i just can't i'm like i need to give them more so then i'm like maybe i need to downsize so i can give them these huge enclosures but then where do you draw the line so it's it's a hard conversation that's going to be like asked forever but there's, it's just as tall as you can go as big as you can go just because they will use it and again if you get it as a captive bred baby and it happens to be like one of mine it's the laziest animal ever a four by two by four probably would be okay but if you're looking at getting a tree monitor you can't bank on the rarity that you get one that doesn't do anything you have to bank on it being a tree monitor and climbing to the ceiling yeah. like we did a some like ship rope deck rope thick rope and i strung it across my ceiling and it was like 20 foot long um piece of rope and it went from the viv up on top of the ceiling which is about eight ish foot tall because it's vaulted so it went to the top of the ceiling and across and one of my tree monitors just climbed up climbed across and i was just like imagine if that was just its enclosure and i didn't have to do this for stimulation and it could just do this in its enclosure so that's why i try and go as big as i can really yeah i imagine monitors are very good at making you feel guilty as a keeper (laughs) <laughs> because, you know, I, I'll have those moments too where I'll look at my enclosures and I'll go, oh, these enclosures look small. Like you, And sometimes they look big, but then sometimes you walk into the room and you're like, oh, no, they look small. So it's just like kind of a perspective thing. But, you know, if you have an animal that's very fast moving and quickly can move from one side to the other, it will automatically make you feel like if that was me, I would not enjoy that. I would want more space to, you know, stretch the legs out and run. Yeah, for sure. And monitors, they, I'm not exaggerating. It's hard to anthropomorphize them, but... They almost appear depressed if they're in an enclosure that hasn't been changed around in like seven to ten days. And it's, whether it's something as simple as you've just added a new log. But if you've done nothing to the enclosure in about a week, I can guarantee you, 
your monitors don't do anything. And as soon as you put that new branch in there, they're like, oh, oh, who's this? What's what's he doing in my neighborhood? Comes instantly over, checking it out, flicking with the tongue. Even if it's only 10 minutes, it's 10 minutes better than what it was yesterday when it's like, yep, same four walls. That branch was there yesterday. Like, oh, yep, yeah, same spot. And I sometimes change the basking spot positions around as well, just, just to try and... So they wake up and they're like, where's the sun? Just to give yeah. them two minutes just to be like, oh, okay, yeah. Just because... Like something so simple as adding leaf litter to Aki's enclosures or any monitor for that matter, but like I like doing it with Aki's because they spend hours like little terriers. They just rummage through it and they're like all new smells and textures and tastes. And a couple of people on Instagram have messaged me and I said, "Oh, just do this." And they're like, "Oh my god!" Like my Aki, I haven't seen my Aki this active since it was a baby. I'm like, "Yeah, because you probably haven't changed its enclosure since it was a baby." And they're like, "Oh no, I haven't." And I'm like, "It's not your fault because no one speaks about it." Yeah. But like a monitor will learn the four wall perimeter within a within two days like as soon as you get your monitor big baby adult it will every inch of that enclosure it will circle and it just that's it it's mapped it's done it knows you know they have little runways they go to the same spots they like the same branches they find what they like and it's it's hard to completely redo an enclosure weekly but like i try and redo enclosures every three to four months like completely same stuff just completely different positions and then I try and add something new or move stuff around at least weekly just to give, as well as obviously new enrichment, like feeding puzzles and toys and different bits and bobs and different stimulus just to keep their brains engaged because I can't be there all the time as a stimulus. And for some species, that's not possible because they're still like flighty. So the monitors that are happy to interact with me, I can become their stimulus. But then on days where, for example, I'm busy, um, for example, like today, I haven't had much time to do monitor stuff that's not fair on my monitors. It's not their fault. I'm busy. So it's my job to now either tonight or tomorrow, make sure I do something. So then if I'm happy to be busy Wednesday, then at least I know they have a new stimulus. So I'm always out on walks trying to find wood. I'm always in like pet shops going, Oh, this is a cool little feeding puzzle, like a Kong or a wicker ball or with the tree monitors. Obviously they use their hands. So you make like test tubes and so much different stuff you can do, but just make sure you mix it up really. Yeah. I mean, it it really goes down to the natural history of the animals, right? You're not talking about necessarily an animal that's going to create almost like a nest or a den or, you know, a, a territory in the wild that is very small, right? Like a section of a tree that they, that's the only place they go. We're talking about animals that are very fast, that are, are happy to move fairly large distances in the wild and go explore and hunt and, and find things. And if you don't provide that in the, in captivity, I don't think it's even a stretch to say that they would become depressed. There probably is some, some actual hormetic effects and, and, you know, neurotransmitters that, that are downregulated a down regulation of dopamine and whatnot for an animal that no longer feels the need to, to explore, right? That exploratory mechanism is such an important part of their welfare, probably that if you remove it, then you will probably get a depressed animal. And that's probably another really important thing for people to hear that if you don't have, like, I know I wouldn't have the time to make sure that I'm constantly adding new things. And, and, and with the snakes, I try to do that as well, but I don't think it is, it needs to happen as often, right? It's like, you know, it's the same concept, but just doesn't have to happen as, as much. And I know I wouldn't be able to do that with a monitor. So that's another good thing for people to hear. Like, okay, I, if, if you do have the time, that's great. If you don't, you might want to look for something different. Yeah, for sure. And it's like, <clears throat> you you 24 7 have to do something like whether it's you it's sort of changing gear but not really it's like the diet like people are like oh well feeding time well some people feed every day some people feed on a tuesday some people feed tuesday wednesday fridays um your monitor will learn the routine and a lot of people say routine is good for monitors i personally disagree with that because they're smart enough to understand tuesday's feeding day oh let's look forward to tuesday like yep yeah. And then they're just like, well, Tuesday's been and gone. Uh, let's wait till you know. And they they understand. Like, I my cockroach tub is purple, bright purple. It's on top of the vibs. If I take the cockroach tub down, even if I'm doing maintenance, all twenty of the things in there pace, and they're pacing yeah. and they're pacing and they're pacing. So that they know, you know. So I've got to move the cockroaches because I can't even take that down because in my head that's that's cruel. Even though it's a stimulus, but they're like, we're getting fed, we're getting fed, we're getting fed, and then you don't feed them. Um, but I don't have a feed. People say, oh, what's your schedule? I don't have a schedule. I don't have a feeding. Like, for example, let's just say an Aki. One day I will feed it two locusts and then it doesn't get fed for four days. And then I'll feed it seven locusts and then it doesn't get fed for three days. And then I'll feed it two locusts and then it doesn't get fed for a week. And then I'll feed it 10 locusts and then it doesn't get fed for four days. And I'll, I, I don't have a base it all on the lateral fold. So if they're out and about and looking around and they've got a lateral fold, okay, they're hungry. If the lateral fold's not there and I know I've fed them within the last two or three days, 
they're not hungry and then they do travel miles in the wild especially um ground uh, terrestrial species the arboreal species obviously travel but the terrestrial species will be traveling and running and chasing stuff down with the arboreal species there's an argument to say they're a little bit more um a little bit more ambush hunters still chasing stuff down but they're more likely to sit and wait and be like okay this is going to come my way and be picking off like katie did and stick bugs which aren't particularly the fastest moving prey items whereas mm. the ground dwellers they're going to be chasing other lizards they're going to be chasing rodents they're going to be chasing um like other reptiles and frogs and ground dwelling bugs have to be quick like cockroaches are going to scuttle away whereas a stick bug is going to be like oh god <laughs> this is the end <laughs> yeah so yeah. yeah so you have to take into consideration that so like i get my mangrove out every time i feed her no matter what i'm feeding her and i make her run like make her run especially if i'm feeding her a rat pup or a chick or like shrimp if she gets bugs i'm not too worried but i still make her run she has to work to get that food because she's in like she's in an eight foot long and if i put food in there no matter what that food is she can shift eight foot like that nothing's getting away from her cockroach locust like obviously if i'm feeding protein it's fresh like pre frozen forward so there's no stimulus there it's like oh thanks for that and all of a sudden she just starts to get fat because she's in her enclosure she doesn't have to run she doesn't have to work but when I get her to come out and she has to run my entire reptile room, which is like a 10 foot space that I section off for her and I'm getting her to go and I try and do it with all my monitors that will allow me to. Some monitors I can't. So then it's silly stuff like suspend something in the Viv where they can't quite get to. Like just suspend it. And it might be a bit <laughs> bit inhumane to tie up a cockroach and pin it to the top of the Viv, but <laughs> think of the monitors. So you're watching Aki and it'll and it starts smelling it and then the tongue starts going and obviously the Jake's is picking it up and it's like right okay there's food here the key's in on it oh we found it and you watch the Aki climb up to the top of the Viv and jump for this like cockroach and if you've got like a four foot tall Viv your Aki don't do that but if you're at a place where you can suspend it like a couple of foot like a foot off the floor where they just can't reach it and they've got a like tripod and just just even if they get it the second time round it's something that they've had to exert energy just to because for the most part, you throw a bug in and people are so it's so fun to watch monitors feed. Yeah, but they're really not having to work just to pin a locust down in a viv. Like, it's yeah. so easy for them. So just make them work. Because that comes into the enrichment. That comes into the health of your animal. Because every single monitor in captivity, like, is overweight to the wild counterpart. It's not a bad thing, obviously. But then you use a fine line between being slightly a above the weight of the wild counterpart and then being fat yeah so you have to toe the line very finely and if you're making your animals work really hard for the food then at least you know it's nice and lean and it's fit and then when it comes to laying eggs and when it comes to breeding and when it comes to like digestion the monitor's so much more healthy or all reptiles for that matter but they're so much more healthy because they've got muscle mass rather than fat that everything just goes so swimmingly and you don't have to, you put the work in and you get the work out. So, yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And, and as, as far as feeding goes, can, can you describe what you meant by the, was it lateral fold? Is that, is that something you're looking for on their body just to see whether or not they are kind of plump or a little bit leaner? Yeah. So a lateral fold is, um, if I demonstrate on myself, so, Oh no, my camera's flipped. Bear with me, everyone. So <laughs> down here, um, on their sides, so the front arms here, and pretty much exactly the middle of their sides, there is like a fold of skin, and it's called the lateral fold. And if your monitor doesn't have a lateral fold, every species lateral fold differs. Some are prominent as hell, some are just visible. So learn Ackies, for example, are just visible, um, whereas mangroves and tree monitors are quite obvious. So if your monitor doesn't have a lateral fold, it's one of three things just eating a lot gravid or fat like that's it it should have it and if it's got too much of a lateral fold it's skinny or dehydrated so again you need to sort of pay attention to but it should just be a little pinch of skin but the tail base should be thick there should be no indent in the tail base that's how you tell dehydration thick strong heavy so the monitor should be hourglass like you see the problem is with social media you see a savannah monitor it looks like this and everyone sees savannah monitors and they assume just by association that they look like this. Whereas they should be thick, come in at the waist and then back out at the tail. The waist should dip in really skinny 
and then the, the top end's muscular with the big all the muscles and the chest and where they're digging and then they dip in at the waist and then the tail base sticks back out nice fat tail base where they store all their energy but then you see them they're either like this and then again when they walk they should be completely upright all fours off the ground belly not sagging unless obviously they're gravid or they've just had a big meal they should you should be able to see completely underneath when they're walking and it's harder for some species so they've got little legs so you can't but like savannah monitors they should be off the floor you should be able to see straight under them and yeah so the lateral fold is my key if the lateral fold is very prominent and my monitor is very active i know it's hungry if the lateral folds there but i know i fed them three or four days ago then they're not getting fed mm -hmm. like monitors i would rather feed two prey items every third day than feed like people throw like a box in five six seven items every third day because two items is enough to sustain them and then they've got the regular but like i say i just don't i don't have a routine i just throw in what i throw in what i deem is fit which is taking me a few years to like figure out but if you've if you've got no lateral fold your monitor needs a diet or you've got a gravid female yeah okay Okay, that's a, that's a really good uh, pointer for people. So maybe we could break down a few kind of just general husbandry things that I'm sure some of them will be generalized for all the species that you keep, and maybe maybe you you might feel the need to branch out and, and specify specifically for certain things. But maybe we'll start with handling and socializing because I think that's a a pretty common one. People want a lizard to be able to play with and hold with, and and, and socializing it with yourself. So where do you sit on that on that department? Do you feel that that's a really important piece of monitor care, or is this kind of getting too carried away? Or so I don't know if it's actual science or fact, but I I. I say there's a difference between a social and a tame animal. So a social animal for me is an animal that doesn't run away when you walk into the room, is an animal that will allow you to tongue feed it, is an animal that shows no, like I say, no stress signs when you're interacting in its enclosure. A tame animal is an animal that you can just pick up and put on your head and be like, oh, yeah, cool, little cute dog. So for me, as long as my monitors are social, because obviously you don't want an animal to be scared of you in captivity, it defeats the object. Being tame is a bonus but i don't i personally don't care for it um because it is a it's on my terms and again you can become a stimulus and you can interact with your monitor but that comes to socialization so if you want a monitor to get out and watch tv with and bits and bobs like that i don't think monitors are for you um they're very keyed into their environment and your house is not their environment an Aki is probably your best bet if you want to get stuff out for like a 30 minute handling session. They're, they're pretty good. They're pretty bomb proof. But for the most part, getting them to come onto your arm for food back into the enclosures is about as much as handling gets. Or like I say, getting them out to run around for a little 10 minute window and then go back into their enclosure is it's not handling, it's socialization. But yeah, there's this massive fad with like super tame tree monitors on social media and everyone wants them and they don't realize it's taken four years to get to that point because you just see a finished product of like, wow. And I personally believe in hands off. You see so many people like brand new fresh monitor. Boom. Oh, it's okay, little buddy. Just Run calm it down. Run hands. Yeah. 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 And then I say it's like when we first tamed horses, we broke their spirit to the point of them like listening to us and then over time of evolution and like symbiotic relationships they're like oh cool man are okay but the very first horses were wild and we had to break them to do our bidding and when you're doing that with a monitor the people forget there's a freeze mode so if you're not being bitten and it's not no longer running in people's head it isn't in fight and it isn't in flight because it's not running and it's not trying to fight well it's in freeze mode so it's like i've accepted my fate my time has come so it's yeah. just like, and then people are like, oh, and then they start to stroke it on top of the head and it closes its eyes. Everyone's like, oh my God, it's so cute. It's stressed. <laughs> like yeah. if you've got, if you've got a wild caught animal that's full of parasites that you don't even know because you can't see because you haven't paid for the fecals and you're getting it out and stressing it out and then putting it in an enclosure that's not even heated correctly. You just got, you're going to have a dead animal. And it's just not, it's, it's not me being like, I just, I just can't fathom people's mindsets because for example, you've just kidnapped someone's bad analogy, but let's just say someone's child and you've put them in your basement and it's not very well lit and they've been used to their fancy houses that and, the other, and you go down there every day and you just pick them up and cuddle them because you want them to love you. This kid is smart enough to know that it's in an alien space. But if you sort of 
take your time. Obviously, Charles are a lot more cognitive than lizards. But you take your time, put it in a mansion that was better than its original home, mm-hmm. shower it with all this food, shower it with this amazing lighting, and you just leave it alone. Eventually, they're going to be like, well, this sucks, but you're not that bad. Yeah. So then they're going to start to learn that you're not the problem. Like to, Literally today, so my baby tree monitor is now seven months old. I've hardly interacted with her ever. She'll tongue feed, but that's it. Today, I earned on the Viv to pick out some poo, and she just launched herself onto me. And I was a bit like, oh, my God, like, you've never done this before. And then she was like, you all right? And I was like, yeah, you? <laughs> and then I was just like, back into your Viv. But that's just seven months of showing up. She's captive bred, which helps. But that's seven months of just showing up, not touching her, just leaving her alone, not being like, come on, little guy, and chasing her around the Viv and scaring the life out of her. That's just me. And I didn't expect it. I didn't expect her to be like that. And then she did it again. And then she did it again. And I was like, oh, okay. So like three times in a row, put my hand out. She comes onto me. And that's not even putting any effort into trying to get her to come onto me. So it's not like she's learned it. So, and you see a lot of people put monitors in the bath. And then they're like, yep, it, you put your hand there and it'll associate you with a way out of the bath. And then why are you putting it in a situation that's stressful to then allow mm. you to be the catalyst to safety? It's just, it's just, in my opinion, it's just selfish. It's just selfish to put an animal into a stressful situation that's going to benefit no one but you. Because yeah. handling is a selfish trait. Like watching an animal exhibit natural behaviors in like an elaborate vivaria, I'm all about. But watching a lizard frantically run through my hands whilst it generally thinks it's going to be eaten, I just that's not why I keep. So, yeah, yeah. There's uh, something called learned helplessness that an animal will exhibit if it realizes that it's in a situation that it can't get out of, and uh, it's amazing how often, especially on social media, that is confused with a calming down. It's relaxing. It's calm. Like you said, it's shutting its eyes. It's finally at peace. And no, you've just scared it to the point where it literally thinks it's going to die and it's just going to wait for the moment uh, for its head to get bitten off by some sort of eagle or, or a primate. And uh, yeah, so, so I think that's a really good point. And, and, but as far as having them, having monitors, like socializing has to be a pretty important piece, right? Especially if you're dealing with a wild caught or you know, a flighty animal, you do want to make sure that you're interacting with them in a way that is positive so you don't have an, an animal that does, you know, shoots up to the top screen when you walk into the room. Yeah, of course. It's so the most recent import I had with the mangroves. So I got five wild caught mangroves, and they came straight off the plane from four days in transit to my house. They didn't go into pet shops or anything like that. They literally came straight to me. Um, I set them up in elaborate decked out enclosures. A lot of people recommend you put a monitor in an empty enclosure so you can keep an eye on it. I don't believe in that. My petro nearly died through that became really dehydrated, incredibly stressed, put them in a big naturalistic enclosure, leave them be. Um, I'm lucky to see my mangroves once a week just because Mm. they are flighty and they are shy, but I've only had them four months. And now four months in, let's just say they live 20 years, and let's say it takes a year for them to get used to me, a year in their 20-year life is nothing. But like if I was going in there every day or having them in a small enclosure in the space of four months, okay, they might have got used to me through stressed, learnt behaviour. But in a year's time, when they finally realise, like, you know what, this guy's not that bad. He doesn't come in. He doesn't try and eat us. He doesn't touch us. He doesn't annoy us. Oh, he's bringing us food. Oh, hello. Like, what's this? And then eventually they learn the tongs and the food is good. And then eventually you can start to... 100% 100% you need a social animal you need because otherwise like you say it's, it's no point in keeping them but there is no rush if you keep them in a in an in, in a dense enclosure with plenty of places to hide they will always feel secure and they'll exhibit a small piece of stress when they see you and they'll run off but obviously over time you keep coming in and they keep running off but then they realize that they're still alive and it goes one or two ways it does go I can just keep running away or it does go well this keeps happening and I'm not I've not eaten. Mm -hmm. And then the curiosity eventually kicks in. Now, it is a long, drawn-out process. It it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes my male tree monitor is only just getting to the point where he'll come out onto me, and I've been working with him for three years. And sometimes he still freaks out, but he didn't have the best start to life, whereas he was in a situation where he was forced to be stressed a lot, and he didn't 
learn that people were okay. So I now have to like erase all of that and then teach them again. So for the mangroves, just leaving them. And for the most part, I've just got several six foot enclosures that are empty because it's just dirt because they're highly fossorial as babies and they just dirt. And it's not very enjoyable. But in a year or two, when they are adults and they're bolder and they're braver and they've learned that I'm a friend, I'm going to have an amazing relationship with them. Yeah. And then for the rest of their 18 years or however long they live, I'm going to have a great relationship with them. But there is no rush. For the most part, just keep them covered for weeks to months, you know. So you put, I'll leave it for a week and then just take it out every day and handle it. Like, I don't know where that's come from. Like, it's yeah. ridiculous. Well, so I think that's another good virtue to add to the keeper list is you probably need to have a higher level of patience. It's not going to be an immediately rewarding experience. Like you might have to put a year, 18 months into the relationship with an animal, even in a captive bred situation in order to have an animal that doesn't flight away when you walk into the room and you can actually tongue feed and interact with it in some way that's not, you know, stressing it to death. Um, Let's talk a little bit about diets. You, you've you've already mentioned a few things as far as your feeding routine is quite random, and you do a sort of a fast and famine or a, a feast and famine a, a scenario as far as seasonality and whatnot. But food wise, is it mostly insects for everything you're keeping? And then you, I think you had mentioned a few other things, but is it mostly insects? Yeah. So my ackies, my kimberleys, my gillenai, so the pygmy mulgars, the whatever odatra do I keep? I think that's it. So basically, your dactria, the dwarf monitors, are 99.9% bugs. So that's cockroaches. I think they're superworms. We call them moria worms. Superworms, um, locusts, grubs, um, stick bugs. <laughs> I, I do three different species of roaches. I tend to avoid crickets purely because they infest my house and I hate them, but I do do crickets now and then. Mm-hmm. But if I'm doing crickets, it's literally you're being tong fed. And if one gets out, then that's it. The rest of you aren't getting crickets for months. So no <laughs> yeah. pressure. So, but yeah, so as many insects as I can get my hand on, for the most part, I staple locusts um, and roaches and then I'll mix in other stuff. Now and then I might give half a pinky. Um, now and then, but I'm not. I'm not big on that. The tree monitors, again, exactly the same, but now and then they do get the odd pinky and now and then they get the odd quail chick. Um, Males more so not, but when I have a female, I probably will give her a lot more protein based around breeding cycles. Um, And then the mangroves and the peach throat, they get a lot of insects. So the big discoid roaches, hisses roaches, um, orange head roaches will take dubias as well. Adult locusts. But then they get a lot of fish, so they get shrimp, squid, crayfish, crabs, um, prawns, uh, five, six, seven different species of fish, whatever I can get my hands on, um, mussels, they'll get chicks, they'll get um, rat pups, I don't do anything with hair, I hate hair, hair clogs them up, makes them lethargic, swells, mm. takes ages to digest, so I stay away from rats and mice that are past pup size. Um but yeah, for the most part, it's all insectivorous. But the the bigger the monitor gets, the more capable it is. The savannah monitor as well, though, 99% bugs. Do not feed your savannah monitor any form of rat, chick. No, 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 no. Especially if your basking spot is not 60 degrees, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, like that sort of temperatures. They can't digest protein properly much below 120, 125. So unless you've got a hot basking spot... Um, they're not going to be able to digest that food properly. And if you're cooler than 110, 105, you're going to start getting that rat or chick starting to rot inside their stomach. Um, they're going to become incredibly bloated. And if you don't get on top of that and don't notice it, then you're going to have a very sad day in the morning. But savannah monitors are insectivorous. They, in the wild, have been documented to find millipedes. They annoy the millipedes to secrete all their toxins. And then when the millipedes are out of toxins, they eat their millipedes. Wow. So they've learned. Yeah, it's cool. It's so cool. And people don't realize as well, again, in the winter time uh, or the the dry season, there's not as many in- insects and bits and bobs around. So the males more so, um, they will become so skinny that they become arboreal. So they'll live in trees for like two months um, because there's too many predators on the ground when they're not fit and healthy. So they'll just go up because there's a lot less predators up than there is down. So people don't realise that and they become like bags of bones. But as long as the tail base is nice and plump and thick where they store all their nutrients. But yeah, mainly bugs. And it's not cheap unless you breed your own. 
um, which a lot of people, you've got to think of your spouse and other people like yeah. parents, like flatmates or whatever. I, there's a there's a cockroach there. I get it all the time. Paul, there's a cockroach there. <laughs> I'm like, if my landlords are listening, she means in the enclosure. But it's <laughs> there's a cockroach there. There's a locust there. There's a, you know, and it's like because it happens. You know, we keep we all keep reptiles. It happens. There's there's bugs everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you have to have a good stash of bugs and it's nice to have, you know, a different different species and you can sort of mix up the variety and whatnot. And it, maybe we can talk a little bit about the lighting as well because I, the lighting and the heating. I, obviously, you know, you'd already mentioned the savanna, the, the hot spots is going to alter a little bit. But do you have a general kind of setup for lighting and heating for most of the species you work with? Yeah, so I've been in talks with um, Roman about the power density working out the 200 watts per square meter and bits and bobs like that so i'm going to buy um i'm going to buy a meter and i'm going to work out the 200 250 watts square watts per square meter and then basically i'm going to figure out what lamp it is do a measurement so i can say to people look this arcadia bulb at x measurement will be good haven't done that yet so what i'm doing at the moment is i'm a massive um proponent perpetuant for leds i think leds are slept on like they do tests and studies on a halogen and a UVB and the lux levels of it in comparison to an overcast day is like, it's like something like 4,000 in the Viv and like 20,000 outside or something silly like yeah, that. In an overcast day. Just, yeah. Yeah. In an overcast day. Exactly. So we're here in the UK, like 360 days of the year. That's like, whatever the math is, 10 times, it's not even 10 times, it's like it's five, six times brighter than what, and then the problem is with people, we look in the Viv and go, oh yeah, it's bright. But then, if you really look in the Viv, you see shade everywhere. Yeah. And I'm quite fortunate that I'm an electrician, so I buy cheapy LEDs. I love Arcadia. I use Arcadia when I can. But for the most part, when you have as many as I do, it's good to have shortcuts. So I buy 6,500 Kelvin high output LED, EVA, E27 um, spot bulbs, LED. So I have a basket spot halogen, an LED spot bulb shining to it just to give me that natural 6,500 Kelvin daylight. And then I'll have the UVB. I buy UVB the same length as the lizard. So if I have a three foot lizard, I go for a three foot, three foot UVB. If I have a two foot lizard, I go for a two foot UVB, obviously so on and so forth. If it's under two foot, I'll go for two foot, but the UVB, I tend to put the halogen in the middle of my UVB. Um, so when they're basking, they get that nice, strong UVI, um, depending on the species, I have a solar meter, so I check my UVB. I try and check it once a month. Um, but I tend to go a bit higher than recommended, whether that's right or wrong. But if, for example, they're recommended a UVI of like 2.5, I'll give them 3.5. I've seen no detriment to it, but in my mind, they're going to be exposed to a lot higher than what we're recommending. Yeah. Um, Savannah monitors have been seen out in something stupid, like 12 plus, like silly, silly, silly midday, and they're recommended in captivity for like six. And I'm not saying to people cook your lizards, but like I just go like 0.5 to one higher than like the recommended for majority of my Australian African species. The tropical species like the tree monitors, um, I tend to stick where is recommended. So if 2.5 is recommended, I tend to aim for about 2.5. The Aki's will be recommended at like four. I'll give them five. Um, and then that also gives me a bit of saving grace. So if the UVI drops, I don't have to rush out and get a new UVB bulb. Um, and then I'll put an LED bar in there, either a jungle dawn, which I love. Um, but I find a, they tend to burn out quite quickly for me because the vivs are so hot. Right. So they, they tend to, cause I, cause I'm, I'm pairing them right by my basking spot. And if I had them on the cool side, I've never had issues, but I have sometimes in the odd, australian species the arcadia bulbs tend to flash and it's basically it's just overheating the unit um so i buy cheapy leds like 6500 kelvin i say cheapy they're like 40 50 quid but the arcadias are like 80 quid so it's yeah, i'm saying yeah. like 30 quid so i don't mind if they burn out a bit sooner and, and again that's an IPs. led bar basically similar to the yeah. similar to the jungle dawn just a different brand yeah yeah, yeah. So they're basically off-brand ones that you would fit in, like, your garage that I get from work. So I get, like, a discount on them. Yeah. So I have my halogen in the middle of the UVB. So the halogen's in the middle of the Viv. I have the UVB one side. I have the LED bar the other side. The LED bar, I'll have the length of the Viv. The UVB, I only have the length of the lizard. And then I'll have the LED spot shining onto the basking spot. And then I'll probably, if I'm feeling generous, I'll give them another LED bar for the front of the Viv that... So most of my vivs have at least one halogen, one LED spot, one LED bar, and the UVB. But my bigger vivs have three to four um, 
halogens they ha or basking I tend to mix it up like I put a deep heat in there just because I find gravid females like deep heat over even though they're different wavelengths but the same from the halogen but I find gravid females like deep heats so I always give a deep heat to a feed so my ackies and my mangroves they get deep heat so they've got deep heat and then I use incandescent and tungsten halogens just to see what they prefer and again it depends on the time of the day and I think now speaking to Roman that's to do with that um what power wattage um watts per square meter unit but yeah, then I have multiple LED bars just to make it as bright as I physically can. Like if there's a space on the roof of the Viv, it's getting an LED. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but then also mm -hmm. make sure you've got shade. Like don't just empty Viv LEDs. You know, make sure that you've got deep soil to retreat to, like a cave, like somewhere they can get under cork bark, cork tubes. I tend to like to leave six to eight inches of one side of the Viv just to drop off to be shadowy shady and again i i adjust it depending on the species so for example the tree monitor in a five foot tall it's still bright at the bottom but if he wedges himself right down behind all the plants it's going to be pretty dark down there you know i'm not trying to like rabbit in a headlights them i try and set it up accordingly so they still have places of shade they still have places to hide but when they're for the, the most part when they're out out they're out in the sun is how i like to see it yeah yeah, no, I think that's that's a really good really good advice. And I have two questions about the bulbs. The first was, is this LED spot bulb just from like an Amazon situation? So you can let us know where you get those. And then the second is, as far as the halogens go or any of the heating bulbs, are they running on a thermostat or are you running them on an outlet dimmer or anything? Or do you just know that a 75-watt bulb gives you this at this distance and you just let them run full? So I'm going to get persecuted for this, but I don't have a single thermostat in my <laughs> room. Not at all. Not at all. You know, um, I think that people <laughs> that don't, like, because I honestly, I don't run thermostats on any of my halogens either because I find them to be very, it's, it's almost like pointless. Like the animal's going to move around the thing. You set it to a certain, for me, I have these outlet dimmers. So I set them to a certain light uh, or a certain output and the enclosure is also six feet long. So for, for whatever reason, it's too hot. The animal's going to move over. If you're dealing with heat tape and heat mats or people are often wiring these themselves because they come deassembled, you know, they're not insulating them properly. You, pro you might want some sort of, you know, fail safe. But yeah, I I'm with you as far as not necessarily having a probe underneath a halogen. Yeah. And there's no thermostat that kicks up to like 60 degrees. So you right. get the high output ones that are like 45 and I'm like, mm -hmm. that's too cold. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Um, also as well. So to my knowledge, you probably know better than me, but dimming halogens reduces the output of the efficiency of them so when you've got a mon an animal like a monitor which is a sun worshiper for the most part speaking actually savannah monitors if you've reduced if you've dimmed your halogen you're reducing the output of it so it's going to do the same thing but it's just a lit a little bit better um and for the most part for me if i was gonna stat them i would put the probe on the very 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 cold side because i don't care how hot my basking spot gets within reason like i don't want it to be like 95 degrees um celsius but if i'm anywhere between 50 and 60 degrees celsius so like 130 to 140 ish fahrenheit i'm okay with that because i tend to design my basking spots raised and they're they're just isolated so the problem is when you've got such a hot basking spot you need to have a massive viv to be able to have a correct gradient mm -hmm. so if you don't isolate the basket spot and you just stick a halogen in there and just that's that you've for example four by two by two for an aki for example i think aki should be about 55 degrees 130 ish fahrenheit you just have a halogen on a rock your whole viv's going to be like 35 degrees and like i like an aki's cool side to be like 26 right and so it's just not it's not feasible so you have to learn to isolate the basket spot so it's just one isolated hot spot that's big enough to cover the whole lizard ideally tail as well but head and body so you're not getting thermal burns because if the beam is on your aki's back just focus there your aki's like well my head and my legs aren't quite warm enough but the back of the aki's getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter mm. and hotter and then eventually you start to get burned so you need to make sure you like my mangrove she's only again two and a half foot but she's got like a three-ish foot basking spot with three different bulbs so she can cover her whole body but that's elevated up so she can go around everywhere else and it her, her viv is 57 degrees on one basking spot and it goes right down to 24 degrees so she's got such a gradient that i'm really not worried because the, the halogen's running at full power 24 7 so as long as my room doesn't kick up yeah. which just means i have to adjust my bulbs in the summer so i have summer and winter bulbs um she's not going to overheat 
And then I have water bowls in every enclosure with every animal that's big enough to get into. And then I also have deep soil for a microclimate in every single enclosure. So worst, worst, worst case, I'm at work, out of nowhere, we're sweltering hot. They have a corner, they have an area where they can retreat to until I get home. So I don't come home to like a load of cooked lizards. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And, and then as far as the spot LEDs, are those just something you get off of Amazon? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so basically I just Amazon, into Amazon, 6,500K, which is Kelvin, which is the level of light. Mm-hmm. So 6,500K, E27, which is your standard screw-in bulb, um, LED spot, IP66 or 64. IP is ingress protection, which basically just means waterproofing because um, I'm in there with a hose like... Psh- so if I'm spraying them, they're going to short out water and electrics don't tend to go too well. So I make sure I buy the waterproof proof ones. So if I spray them, it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. And they're about, they're about 15 to 20 pounds. Um, so they're really not that expensive. And branded ones are about 35 to 45. And I have tested them against branded ones. They're not in the sense of just what I can see. They're not as bright the off-brand ones but the branded ones definitely aren't in my opinion double the money at least for what i can see obviously the branded ones i i'm not anti-brand i I have arcadia pretty much everything but when you're trying to cut corners in what i can see i like reptile branded ones because obviously they have been designed for reptiles they're not just like this is a light for your garage this is a reptile light with so i'm massive i don't want to be like i love arcadia i'm i'm not sponsored by them or anything like that i just buy their stuff i really like their stuff um but for the most part if i'm just setting up a viv that's that's just like okay i need an led all right 15 quid yeah i've got one and then if i ever get a spare 50 quid or whatever then i'll buy like a, a jungle dawn bar or buy um like a reptile system spot because i know that they do them but for the most part i'm saving money on the lighting outside of the uvb i don't buy off band halogens either i've always buy reptile branded arcadia halogens um which is weird because that's probably the one I should skimp out on because a halogen is a halogen. But for some reason, I always buy branded. So I'm either using their incandescent, um, um, not the spot, but the solar flood. I like those quite a lot. But the problem is with incandescent, you get less heat per watt. So I have to use like a 100 watt, whereas a 35 watt halogen tungsten would do the same thing. But right. I know that they work, so I run more wattage, but I know that they work. So yeah. And what about seasonality as far as temperature or wet season, dry season? Are you implementing that for most of the species that you keep? Yeah, so every single species gets it, um, whether they like it or not. But they they get it. So I don't give nighttime temperature, nighttime heat to anybody, full stop. Um, my room, I've only been in this place since November, so I haven't run a whole year with this place yet. But my room here got down to 16 degrees celsius in the winter and i checked the vivs and they were about 17 degrees um i'm okay with that as long as i don't go much below 14 i'm okay for the species i keep i'm not particularly worried um but then during the day the basking spots will stay the same yeah so regardless of when winter or summer the basking spots are the same but the ambience of the viv will obviously be colder in the winter because my room is colder and then in the summer the ambience of the viv get hotter and then for the most part, for everybody, winter, I'm barely spraying because I don't like cold and wet. I, I find being very humid and cold, you're going to get RI. So I don't really spray in the winter. And if I'm spraying, it's in the morning. So the viv's got a chance to dry out. So I, they're not really humid at night. And then I'm barely feeding them as well because obviously they're not as hot. and Their metabolism is slowing down. So I don't want their stomachs filled with food. Because if they're filled with food, they're going to try and bask and they're going to be trying to be more active and their metabolism is going to kick up because I'm feeding them and then, then the viv isn't there to sustain that. But you can't just go, right, okay, switch off. So that's why I have, I run with my seasons. I don't try and fight the weather. So Northern Hemisphere, more or less November, December, January is my winter. February, um, forgetting the months, February, <laughs> March, April, um, I start to kick up into spring, like May through to September. Again, I'm ramping up. So June, July, August is my main summer. And by summer, I'm spraying every day, some species twice a day. And I'm feeding a lot more. So if I was feeding sporadically three times a week in spring, I'd be sporadically feeding five times a week in summer. And then as we go into autumn, I'll pretty much repeat spring. But obviously, it's dropping down now. And then we... So... um, 
September, end of September, I start to wind down. October, and then we're in November into the winter. Um, and a lot of people say to me, like, do you not have issues with the barometric pressure? Because obviously we want to use the rain for triggering, triggering breeding cycles. But for the most part, my mangrove has been very consistent every three months. Um, and I can't get Aki's to stop breeding. So I'm doing something right with those two species. I haven't, I've had eggs from Timorensis. Sadly, they're infertile, but I haven't tried to breed any other species. But for anything else, it's just... It's their part of their natural ecology. All the species I keep experience some form of seasonal change. They're not... Because um, people... People will say, well, tree monitors. Like, smack ring right there on the equator. That doesn't change. It doesn't drop. Well, the temperature's taken from, like, the top of a weather dial somewhere. And when you're in the rainforest, if you think about it, we're wet season. They don't get hot and cold, but we're wet season. So there's a lot more cloud cover. There's rain coming in. There's a lot of humidity, which obviously then ramps to, like temperature in a way because it's humid it's more dense it's hot and when it's the dry season there's no cloud cover people assume it's hot but down in the canopy there's no cloud cover so all the humidity dissipates so then all of a sudden it gets cooler Mm. so not a lot we're not talking crazy amounts like oh my god like it's freezing but i think people forget that there are these changes and australia as well like depending what part some that's some places like darwin i'm pretty sure have like three months of monsoon like just torrential rain and the, the ackies are like oh my god people don't realize and then in the in the north south i forget in the south of australia it gets really cold like whatever way around it is but it gets really cold in the winter like down to like seven eight nine ten degrees yeah you know and these animals are finding refuge and people are just assume oh it's an aki it's hot 24 7 it's dry 24 7 like they come out it gets too hot for them so then they go and seek refuge in their humid burrows so if you bump your humidity slightly in the viv you might see your aki just a little bit more mm. and as far as photo periods i imagine if you're dealing with mostly equatorial species or many of your animals live near the equator there's not a big difference from fall to winter to spring as far as how long the lights are on but are you adjusting any of that or do you just keep the lights static the whole year and it's just dry wet yeah so i keep the lights the same the only thing that changes is so my lights are more or less 10 a.m to 10 p.m and i do it that way because i work more or less seven till five so it gives me five hours of an evening to interact with my animals Mm. um so i do 10 till 10 in the winter it's not really getting light until eight a half eight um but now it's seven o'clock in the morning my reptile room's light um yeah. my mangrove will be out, out at seven o'clock in the morning like basking even though there's no lights on for another like two or three hours so they do get a bit of like well the sun's up but we're not getting warm so they get a longer photo period inadvertently in the summer and then they get a shorter one in the winter but that's only because of my room rather than what i do with the lights now, I think we've covered some of the more basic things as far as just general things I think people should be thinking about if they want to get a monitor, you know, the, the, the lighting, that's a lot of lighting, it's a lot of food, a lot of space, um, socializing is a big commitment, so I think those are some major things. Uh, is, is there any things that you see from people keeping monitors that you think that you would regard as maybe mistakes or missteps that you would, that, that you that you want to comment on or, or you know, help people ha- who have made these things, um, these, these errors and, and reverse them? I think the biggest thing is more so in the States. And again, I'm not just before I say anything and like anyone that's listening to it, I don't know what opinion I have or haven't given off, but everyone starts somewhere like no matter who you are, no matter what you've kept and no one is an expert. And if they tell you they're an expert, then they, they, they should give up because they're not like, we're all learning. We're all growing. We're all evolving. And just a quick caveat. So <laughs> I recently got some discoids, roaches, um, deaf head roaches, whatever you want to call them. And the guy that gave them to me, I've never kept them before. The guy that gave them to me said, like, same as dubious, males are winged, female aren't winged. Perfect. I must have fed off about a thousand pounds worth of females to my mangrove because it turns out the females are winged. I didn't know. <laughs> I should have learned because I should have done my own research, but I was told by someone now all of a sudden I'm in an echo chamber. And I just assumed the person that told me was right. And I've given some discoids away to people. So I've had to ring them up. Don't feed the wings one. The females, the females have wings. And they're like, oh God, I've fed them all off. So we're all guilty of it. And what I say to people is just just quickly on it. Speak to everyone you can, read everything you can, watch everything you can and get a graph. And if, for example, Aki's basking temperature, 50, 50, 45, 45, 32, 60, 60, 50, and then plot the graph and then take the average and then learn 
for example, let's just say the average you found is 45. You do 45. Oh, my Aki's basking for 35 minutes. It's too long. Bump the temp. You'll learn your own way. So everyone starts somewhere and everyone's only as good as the person that taught them, right? So it's, it's no one's fault if you're doing things wrong. But what's important is you can always make a change. And as long as it, you're willing to change to benefit your captive, you're no longer a bad keeper. It doesn't matter if it takes you six months to get there. As long as you're saving with a plan and you've just got enough money to buy that new enclosure, but then all of a sudden this, I don't know, uh, Nebronia tempts you and you buy an Nebronia, like, mm, come on, like, you know, you, you need to upgrade. So just with that out of the way, a lot of people start with rubbish lighting and rubbish enclosures. Like a lot of people start in glass, just fish tanks and have nothing but a halogen bulb on them. And for the most part, they're wild caught animals being thrown into these situations. People don't give enough deep substrate. People don't give enough fresh water people don't feed correctly like today i was messaging someone about a rudicolis which is a rough neck monitor i said oh hey what you've been feeding it i've been feeding it nothing but chicks how long have you had it for two years what else have you fed it nothing why have you only been feeding it chicks for two years well the pet shop told me that mm -hmm. it's not his fault he 50 percent on the pet shop 50 percent on him and he should have learned that do uh, discoids have wings everyone female discoids have wings <laughs> but you so it's just make sure you do your, your research because like a, a lot of people i'm guilty of it i've been post brought animals i was going to go and buy my seventh mangrove the other day it's only because it sold before i could buy it like we all do it i was like oh that one's nice i need seven so we, we all do it but it's just important to hold yourself accountable do your research before you get anything and just be like can i house this x space enclosure in a year in two years in four years can I provide free basking spots? Can I do this? Because it's all well and good when you buy an animal that's this big and you can put it in a two foot long enclosure. You can't, but a lot of people do. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's just, I think that's the biggest mistake. I think a lot of people get sucked into the allure of social media and they see how cool these animals are because myself included, we're all guilty of it. We just post a picture with a cool little caption and everyone's like, wow. And no one sees the behind the scenes of like, trading through the sludge and the mud to get to where i was for that two second video that now gets loads of likes see that's my biggest like gripe with it you need to make sure you are doing your research and it's okay to make mistakes i've made hundreds i've made thousands i had a tree monitor escape literally got out of my flat and lived outside in the wild for 11 days until my girlfriend came home and found it on the doorstep wow like, with all you haven't got to tell me craziest story ever but like I'm happy to hold my hands up and be like, I messed up. And to this day, vents were in, doors were closed. How did it get out? I don't know. <laughs> and that's the worst <laughs> bit. I, I wish a vent was out so I could be like, oh, okay. But as long as you're happy to hold your hands up and go, do you know, because I think the biggest problem is like red bulbs is another thing. You say to someone, hey, by the way, this red bulb's bad, blah, 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 blah. The animals can actually see it. It's causing you know, the eye issues. It's also not giving you like the correct wavelengths, this, that, and the other. It's not giving you the correct light in spectrum. You need a 2,700 Kelvin to meet the natural like cycle of the daylight, this, that, and the other. And I think people feel offended that they've been care caring for their animal badly, so then they automatically go on the defence. And it doesn't help that some people trying to help come across like twats. So they're like, you're doing this wrong. Your, your animal's suffering. But if someone's trying to give you constructive criticism please don't take offense take five ten minutes to like think about it and don't because i know this firsthand because one i've experienced it and two i've had people tell me it they go i felt so guilty for caring for my animal for two weeks two years 20 years wrong mm -hmm. but yeah. it's it's never it's just never too late to change it's never too late you know like i look at some stuff that i keep now and i feel so guilty because i impulse bought it or for example my mangrove i was like oh yeah <laughs> walk in the park and it's been such hard work. But over time, I've learned to love the species. And now I have six because I've learned what it takes. And I've made a lot of mistakes with my mangrove because no one would share with me. No one would help. So I had no point of call. So I've had to make mistakes. And it, it's really hard because it, your animal has to suffer for the rest of your collection to flourish. And that's the truth of the situation when you don't do your research. And if you do your research and just wait that extra six months, your animal won't have to suffer because you can learn from people like myself that are willing to share. Cause we are out there, like listen to Dylan's podcast. Cause there are people talking about experiences. You can't, you can't be perfect from day one, but you can be like damn is near it. And you can have the setup running for two months and you know, everything's bang on. So things happen. Animals escape, animals get out. You know, I nearly lost my mangrove and I was going to sell all of my animals. Um, 
over Christmas because she had a bit of chick stuck in her throat and it lodged in her throat and like nearly caused her to like suffocate and die. Um, and this was on the 27th of December, so everything was closed. And I literally sat in front of the Viv and cried because there was nothing I could do. And I just had to hope she would like regurgitate it up. Things happen. Like, it's not, sometimes it's no one's fault, but if you're as well prepared and you've surrounded yourself with a good network of keepers that you... Like, I, <laughs> I called a keeper in the UK... And I literally, I test, messaged him. He's a monitor keeper, like a really good guy. And I messaged him. I said, hey, mate, I'm really struggling here. He just called me. He's like, what's up? And this is on like the day after Boxing Day at like 11 o'clock in the morning. And I'm like crying. Like, I don't know. My man grows doing this. And my man, because I, I didn't know. And he was like, oh, what about this? What about this? You know, so you have to put yourself into these positions where you've got a good network of people around you. Like it takes, it, it takes a village or whatever the saying is, you know, you can't expect yourself to know everything so you have to learn as much as you can and then surround yourself i've sort of digressed but just do your research and don't don't believe everything you see on social media because if you for example the round savannah monitors like you just associate that with how they should look Mm -hmm. have a look at them in the wild have a look at the species you want to get in the wild and see what it looks like if yours in captivity is slightly chunkier okay you, you love it a little bit more than the six months famine period it's just had but don't just assume that your one point of call pet shop knows everything about everything. And, oh yeah, that Savannah Monitor will be fine in a 6 by 2 by 2 its whole life. It is your responsibility to back that information up with other people that have been through the trenches and through the mud and have lost Savannah Monitors, sadly, to bad care and have learnt since. I'm using Savannah Monitors because they're like the poster boy for bad monitor care. Yeah. But, yeah, again, I've digressed, so I'm sorry. But just... Yeah, do research. <laughs> no, that's good. That's I think that's excellent advice, and and especially when you are stepping into a world as complicated as monitor keeping, it's good to it's good to have a community around you and learn from other keepers and and be obs- observant about what you're experiencing. Like you said, everything online is just someone else's experience. So the, the best way to learn is by watching your animals. Like you said, you know are, how are they basking? Are, how are they utilizing the space? And I think that's good. I, I kind of want I want to ask a question that's um, slightly a left turn from this conversation. As far as the venom theory for monitors, do you have an opinion on that as far as ven- uh, monitors having uh, some sort of mild venom? <laughs> You've opened a can of worms, my friend. Okay. You've opened a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I took a bite from a prosinus. Um And when I say I took a bite, I took two, t- three teeth, two in the top of my finger, one at the bottom. Okay. I pulled away, which you should never, never do, but I did. I thought I could get away in time. I didn't. It nicked me. The blood... Like I've sliced my thumb open with a Stanley blade before, so and I had to go to the hospital to have stitches and stuff. So I'm no stranger to like a deep cut, and that did not bleed as half as much as the tumor I did. It was oozing and oozing blood, and I was like, Jesus Christ! And it was stinging from the what, second. Was, there, bit, is it an, just, was it an incision, or was it basically just like three small pinpricks with a slight pull in them? So two of them were incisions. They where I pulled away, they actually sliced the top of my finger. Okay, okay. But then it's. It's strange because the top of the finger is the bony bit. The bottom is obviously the, the like chubby bit. But I had one pin prick in the bottom and two tiny, I'm talking tiny incisions, not like gashes. Like They were slices, but they were, they were tiny. And it was stinging more or less instantly. And I just assumed it's because it hurt. And I was like, oh, rinsing it under cold water for 20 minutes. And it was still stinging. It was still stinging. And then my hand started going numb. And I was like, it must be because I'm running my hand under cold water. So my hand's gone numb. Um, so anyway, so I bandaged it up electrician style, just with <laughs> some kitchen roll and electrical tape. And I was like, that'll do. And then 20 minutes, 25 minutes in, my forearm starts getting like really itchy and quite hot. And I'm like, yeah, venom. Um, and I've been bitten by an adder. Uh, the UK's only venomous snake when I was a kid. So I don't remember it very well, but I'm, I have a, a like a vague memory of a, a venomous bite. Um, and then my arm starts tingling and all of a sudden my, um, my bicep starts like getting a bit tight and tingly and pins and needles all the way up to my shoulder. And at this point, it's about an hour had passed and my whole hand had gone completely numb. I had full dexterity. I could do whatever I wanted, but like you could prick it with a pin and it didn't feel a thing, did not feel a thing. Um, and I was still bleeding at this point as well. It'd been an hour and obviously that could just be an anticoagulant, but, um, yeah. And then I had pins and needles in my arm for four hours maybe. And then my hand didn't come back to normal properly, properly for over a week. Wow. Um, some people for certain species, their throat seizes up. Um, some people for certain species, the whole hand swells. 
Um, I'm very fortunate that I haven't taken many bites, but I've seen some bites that are only indicative signs of envenomation. Like people say, oh, it's bacteria, it's this, but then it, don't be wrong, it can get in the bloodstream, it can, but it would be local. Like they're causing effects like seizing of the throat, slurred words, um, dizziness, nausea, those sorts of things. They did a testing of the compound. I don't know the science of it because I'm not smart enough, but they did a testing of the compound of the venom of the Prusinus complex, so the tree monitors. Um, and they were doing all these different studies and this, that. And the blue tree and the green tree, the venom, if we're calling it venom, completely disintegrated the test subject that they were testing it on, making sure how it would interact, how the saliva would interact with the, with the test medium. The blue tree and the green tree completely destroyed the medium. And they were saying that it would only have been done if it was venom. Like mm-hmm. nothing else could have destroyed it other than a powerful venom. Um, but it's like anything. Like some people eat a peanut and that's then done. So yeah. it depends how your body reacts to it. My body clearly doesn't like Prusinus saliva, but I 100% wholeheartedly believe that they have a very poor delivery system, but they are venomous. Yes, they are yeah. venomous to a degree. And when you're getting into the bigger monitors that eat mammalian prey, then you tend to find that people have a worse adverse effect, whereas tree monitors are going to be more avian and insectivorous, so the envenomation isn't going to affect mammalian. But I've spoken to a few people, and they've had tree monitor bites, same as me, some people worse. Mangroves, apparently, are really they've got a dirty bite. Um, yeah, croc monitors, they do so much damage when they bite that it's hard to tell, but they're supposed to be quite bad. Black throat monitors tend to make people like... Yeah, they shut the throats, shut their throats up so they can't breathe. Um, yeah, they're definitely venomous. We haven't done enough study on it, and I don't think people want to. <laughs> but in as a monitor keeper, if you ask any monitor keeper, and especially if they've been bitten by a monitor, they will tell you that they're venomous. Not venom as like we think of it, like hypodermic needles injected into you, but it'll be like a. I guess like a hog nose that there's a poor delivery system there. If it gets you, you can have a reaction, yeah. um, but it's not going to be for everyone. And it's going to depend how bad the bite is, where the bite is, stuff like that. Yeah. So there's clearly some sort of oral toxin that they can deliver. And that's, and that's why I asked because I think everybody who I have asked who has been bit by a monitor in any capacity has said this came to the same conclusion as you, like there's something going on there, whether it's technically a venom or it's just some sort of, I mean, I, it's like, where do you draw the line between venom and the toxic saliva? I mean, toxic saliva sounds a lot like venom to me, but uh, I, everybody experiences like the anticoagulation s- scenario where there's, there's lots of blood. And uh, I think it's fascinating. I think that's such a cool aspect of, uh, you know, an additional, an amazing aspect for, for what's a, what is an incredible group of species to begin with. Um, wh- why don't we just wrap up telling people what, what you are up to uh, with your social media and YouTube, because you had already mentioned it, I think once or twice throughout the podcast, just you have set up this platform to help people. And what, what can people expect from the content that you produce? Yeah. So when did I start? I think it's been, it'd be a year this month. So I've been doing it for a year, um, YouTube and Instagram, just as Paul's monitors. And I only started purely because I would go on Facebook, which I now no longer use. Like, I hate Facebook. So I I'd go on there and I'd see these enclosures or I'd see these monitors and I'd see this and I'd see people in the comments one of two ways. One person would be like, oh, cool, looks great. And I'd be like, it's not, it's terrible. Mm. And then other people will be like, it's effing this, effing, you're a disgusting human being. You should like do this and do that. Whereas I would be like, hey, I'd recommend this change because, again, I genuinely believe everyone starts somewhere and this person might genuinely be proud of it and you can't just say to someone and just go in there and, like, poo-poo all over their new enclosure that they've just maybe spent $200 on but actually they needed to spend 700 on. Like, they might not know. It could be the pet shop, you know, like me with the discoids. Lesson <laughs> learned. So I was like, I need, I need to start my own platform so i had instagram like we all do i had like no followers i didn't really post so i was like i'm gonna start taking this seriously um and then i went on a podcast with my friend who's now relatively big in the sense of small youtubers but he was a small youtuber like a a nobody same as me and i was like oh hey do you want to come on the podcast and we ended up becoming friends and he was like you're so passionate you should like do i was like i don't know i hate my face i hate my voice i don't want to do youtube i just want to do instagram um 
and then I remember speaking to you actually and you gave me good advice saying like just do it just post so thank you for that I want to say publicly like I appreciated your advice because obviously you're I look up to you as like a podcaster and a person in the hobby so like that meant a lot to me like okay yeah just do just do it so then I just was like hey guys I'm here to talk about this is the eye and yeah. now it's grown into this like little community that <laughs> a guy in my chat is called the Fellowship of the Varanus clearly a Lord of the Rings fan and every <laughs> Sunday night we just hang out I'm thing is I'm not scared uh to say my opinion but I try and do it respectfully so like mm. if someone asks me like you say a left field question or something that's a bit more taboo I will give an opinion on it right or wrong I will give an opinion on it um and I'll always caveat it because a lot of people think I'm anti-handling because I'm like don't handle your monitors like just back off Leave. everyone's like oh my god Paul. like go on my Instagram I handle my monitors <laughs> like I'm not anti-handling I just I like to I like to be monitor led. I like to do everything on their terms. Like I yeah. don't, and I don't want to give the illusion that it's easy. So I try not in every post, but I try on Instagram to give a descriptive post of what's going on. Like tongue flicks, for example, we didn't really touch on it. So just quickly, if your monitor's in your hand and it's not flicking its tongue, it's scared. Fact it just is it's scared. You want long, slow tongue flicks. If it's just got its tongue slightly sticking out, it's scared. You know, long, and if the tongue goes sideways, then great. So I try and put little descriptive things like that. I try and explain all the stuff that's going on. Um, I'm quite open about like my mental health and stuff, which I think a lot of people resonate to because I think a lot of people resort to reptiles to sort of help them. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people like the fact that I'm very open and I don't hold anything back because I just am an electrician from the UK that keeps lizards. That's it. You know, I'm I'm no I'm a no one. I'm a, I'm just a guy that loves reptiles and now monitors and i'm happy to share my mistakes my journey like i reply to every single person that messages me regardless of how stupid because i don't know your background i don't know if you've spoken to a million keepers and you're just ignorant or if you've just plucked up the courage to message me and you've never so i treat everybody like they know nothing until i understand more um and I can be a bit brutal sometimes, but I think that's just like my ADHD or autism tendencies. <laughs> but I don't mean to be. I try to just be honest to the point, respectful. And I'm just trying to bring everyone together just to love the same animals that I love. So that's that's the reason. I st it's going all right, to be fair. It's, it's gone off. I didn't expect to get a thousand followers on either ever. Um, and I've surpassed that. So I'm, I'm very grateful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, you, you like you, you said you or as, as your friend had told you, you are very passionate about what you're up to. And I think if you, people who are passionate and are willing to have an openness level to share the information and to be uh, easy to communicate with, those are the type of communities that grow quite quickly, especially when it's something so specific. Like it's a very, it's a niche thing. It's not like you're just talking about reptiles in general. It's monitor specific. So I, I really do encourage anybody who even has an inkling of interest, even if you're not a monitor person, go check out Paul's stuff because it's fascinating. But if you are particularly a monitor person, whether you're getting into it or you already are, it's a he he's a huge resource for that and and like like you said you're still learning it's it's not just like you're this end all be all i have all the information it's it's a journey that the people that are in your community can go along with you which i think is is exactly how you want to have it um is there anything that we left unsaid today that you wanted to mention before we wrap up i don't think so i think i think the biggest i said it earlier but like i think the biggest thing for me is get the animal you want don't let a pet shop like I don't like beginner species because they're hardier it just means that they're harder to like kill like, I just don't I don't yeah. like it so <laughs> they're beginner species for a reason because obviously they are more forgiving of mistakes and we all have to start somewhere but like if if you don't want to be a dragon and you want an Aki just just like I see a lot of people it doesn't matter how old they are but I see a lot of young people um, and I'm not old so people like in their teens they're like i'm gonna get a savannah monitor and i'm like if you really want a savannah monitor and you really want to put yourself through that trenches i'm all for it like i'll be here all the way through but have you really thought about it and then you go for all these different things and you list two or three things and people are like oh i didn't know that and i'm mm -hmm. listing the most basic stuff and i don't care like i personally don't care if you're going to mess up with your monitor I care about your monitor having to go through it. Like yeah. you 
stuff you oh no my monitor's this like you'll get over it like that's not me being that's me being my brutish blunt ways but your monitor won't so mm. that's why i'm here i'm here for your monitor like i think like most reptile people i'm a bit of an introvert even though i talk for days but yeah i like my phone non-stop but i'm here for the monitors so i just think just please do your research get the species you want but make sure it's a species you want and sometimes you get a species and it's really not what you want but what i've learned from experience is if you've done enough research and spoken to the right peoples you'll learn the cons before you have to learn them firsthand so like if i when i got into pilbara rock monitors honestly if i did my research i would have never have brought one oh my god this, this is so stunning i need it ah oh, whim yeah purchase buy amazing ah oh, i haven't seen it for six months because it's incredibly shy that's not <laughs> yeah. really for me so if i'd done my research i would have probably been like they're stunning they're amazing i love them but they're just not a captive for me because the cons are they're shy that doesn't yeah. <laughs> i keep mangroves the shyest monitors in the world but <laughs> for me the, the pill bar is they just don't fit my needs of wants so i can't handle the cons but if i did my research i would have learned that so I, i've said it a lot but if you just do your research there are people out there I, i've had a couple of people message me and they're like i can't find any resources and it helps that i'm further up the tree but like I found them and that's not me being like big head or anything. Like when I was a nobody and when I was like, it's so easy for people to message me back now. Cause I've got numbers after my name on Instagram. So I've got followers, people that indulge me and that's horrible that the way that the world is. But when I had a hundred followers and I message people, people don't reply. Now I've got over 8,000 people reply mm -hmm. and I hate that about social media, but it's the reality. But then there are some people that will reply. So just message, message, message. And don't think you're being a burden because your lizard or snake or tortoise or whatever will love you for it in five years time when you've only messed up twice rather than 50 times so that's just my advice so don't rush do research i'm guilty of it please learn from my mistakes <laughs> free monitors in walk-in enclosures is 10 times better than what i have what i have looks cool on instagram but in reality it's not, it's not fun free massive walk-ins with free species you're incredibly passionate about I would take any day of the week if I did it again. People say, oh, why don't you do it now? I love my animals. I don't have a monetary figure to 95% of them. I'm too little too late. Yeah. So please learn from my mistakes. Well, I think, again, that's uh, you hit the nail on the head as far as advice goes. Can you let everybody know where they can find your Instagram and YouTube? Yeah, so it's literally just Paul's Monitors um, on YouTube and um, Instagram. My podcast is called the Captive Raptors Podcast, but it's under Paul's Monitors. I'm live every Sunday. I have different guests on every Sunday um, at 8 p.m. UK time. I'm just live on Sundays. Come and hang out. Come and ask questions. I I reply to everyone on Instagram. I'm normally quite responsive. <laughs> it's the bane of my life, but I do reply to everyone. So if there are any questions, please message me. I'm relatively friendly. <laughs> And I won't attack you. I won't tell you you're an idiot. I won't tell you you're doing it. I'll tell you you're doing it wrong, but I'll try and do it politely and constructively rather than just going, you're an idiot, sell your animals. I'll be like, oh, hey, let's do this, isn't this? So I've had some people send me a monitor in a rack and told me that the pet shop told them to do it. Thankfully, I didn't attack them. And I was like, hey, do this, do this, do this. The guy went out and spent literally $1,000 the next day. And he was like, thank you so much, man. That's what I needed to hear. But when the pet shop told me to put it in a dark box, and I said, I have a snake rack at home. And they said, yeah, that'd be fine for a few months. He was like, I just assumed it wasn't his fault. Tiny echo chamber. Good for him for trying to better his care of his, his lizard. So there are good people out there. It's not just me. There are, there are a lot of good people out there in all manner of the hobby. Surround yourself with good people. Like, Message me. Message. If, if I don't know the answer, I won't lie to you. I'll just tell you my opinion. And then I will find someone that knows the answer and will be able to help you. So just message. Awesome. Well, Paul, I really appreciate you spending the two hours with me today and doing all the work you're doing. And I think with this episode, hopefully it either motivated people to jump into verandas even more and then demotivated those who are on the fence and now know like, this is not for me. I can appreciate them from a distance. Like I'm one of those people that's like, they're amazing. I, I love watching them, love seeing you guys keep them, but they, I just know that it's not my, maybe, maybe one day in the future, but, but, uh, I can tell the amount of commitment and the passion that you must have to to jump into this group of animals is pretty extreme so and i know there'll be a, a good percentage of people who are ready for that challenge and hopefully we can send them over to you as well so anyway thank you so much for for jumping on the podcast and uh, we'll do another one again in the future for sure 
No, no. Honestly, I've been watching your stuff for years, like like since like when you started. And I remember like watching your videos before you became a podcast. And now the fact that I'm sort of here talking to you about is it's full circle kind of crazy. So yeah, well, look at us now, eh? <laughs> crazy. But yeah, no. Thank you. I, I don't know if like many people thank you for the work that you're doing because um, obviously I'm friends with Liam, so I've got a little bit of background scoop. Um, so I know the work that you put in. So fair play to you and what you're doing is it's just it's you're very humble with it. You shouldn't be. You're making a massive change to reptiles far and wide and insects and mammals in a couple of episodes. But and hermit crabs, I like that one. <laughs> yeah. So oh, I just unplugged my headphones. But yeah, so I really appreciate you and your work and all that you do and. I'm looking forward to more podcasts and I'm very grateful to have me on and to talk about my favorite species, the lizard. So, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, I, th- I really appreciate that feedback as well. So thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. That is the end of that episode. Paul, thank you so much for joining me and sharing all your knowledge with us. And like I said, at the end, I'm so happy that you've decided to produce or pursue content creation. I think you're going to be a valuable resource for people. And to the listeners, I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I hope this was a, a, a general enough episode to spark that fascination in these incredible animals while simultaneously craving you to go out and find more information. I probably didn't, that did not sound grammatically correct, but I think you know what I mean. I didn't want an episode that's focused specifically on one species. I wanted something that gave us a broad brush in order to maybe now we can take another step. Maybe we can have Paul again on the future and maybe pick two or three species to kind of go into the nuance of. But if you are someone who's actually thinking that they might want to get into keeping varanids hopefully this episode convinced you one way or the other like i said at the end i think it would definitely convince me that i'm not ready to keep them at any time soon but maybe you got through the whole episode and any of those red flags that came up you thought no i can 100 percent handle that i have the money i have the space i have the time and if you're one of those people i'm super excited for you i do hope you do get into keeping because anybody who keeps varanids is never going back. They always are completely obsessed with them. So anyway, Paul, thank you so much. Listeners, thank you for listening. If you're looking for more information on the podcast, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. If you would like to become the 100th patron, you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home. There you have access to the Discord server and you also have early access to the episodes. And really at the end of the day, that money goes directly towards helping produce the show, whether that's editing, server space, it camera equipment, recording equipment, so on, my time, which uh, we do take uh, quite a lot of my time to produce the show. So any of that is much appreciated. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring the podcast. Again, affiliate links are in, in both the show notes and the YouTube description. And we will stop this episode here. I think that's everything. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I will catch you in the next episode.